one. Good morning, and welcome again to the Hans Christian Andersen Storytelling Series. It's a beautiful day here in New York, and we'd be out in the park, so we hope that um, you all have a wonderful time listening from your home or wherever you are. We have three fantastic storytellers today, April Armstrong, Regina Ress, and Randall McGee. Here they are. Now, I want to introduce my um, technical magician co host and friend, Simon Brooks. And we're doing the best we can with tech today. Uh, we have two people who are out west, and it might get wobbly or they might disappear or freeze up. And if they do, they'll have to leave and come back on, which is some of the curious delight of performing live on StreamYard or any other internet, but I'm sure you're going to love all of it. <laughs> Robin Beatty listening in her backyard in Brooklyn to us all. So I, I want to um, start by saying lots of these stories today are about inanimate objects that have a life. They speak, they have feelings, and there's a an incredible um, brilliance to how Anderson really made things alive and gave them voice, very often as social commentary. And even though these were radical in the 1840s and 1860s, they're really meaningful today. And we want you to listen if you're with your uh, family. If there's something ordinary in your house, you could create a small story about that object as well. Um, I've been hearing April Armstrong tell stories for many years. It's a complete delight. She's a New York storyteller, and she's won many awards and has performed in the theater and does tremendous work for children in schools in New York City. And this year, she won the J.J. Arno uh, New Artist Award. She has many CDs. We'll tell you about them later. And the story that she's telling, actually, the teapot, was written in 1863. So welcome, April. Thanks, Laura. It's so great to be here with everybody. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start. Uh, my story is called The Teapot. People used to have teas, which means they served tea on a tea table, and it was a very elegant and wonderful event. They had cups with saucers that sat on saucers. They had a sugar bowl and a little creamer. And most importantly, they had a tea pot. And people would come and they would sit and they would have a little cake maybe and they would have their tea. Do you like tea? I do. I like to put in milk, no sugar. Now, but this is not a story about the people serving the tea. This is a story about the teapot. This is a story about a very, very proud teapot. Can you say these words after me? She was a teapot, but she was a me pot. 
short and stout with a handle and a spout. She didn't care about nothing, no one. No cups nor saucer, she was the bosser. Just tip her over and pour her out. It was a very proud teapot. And she talked about how wonderful her handle, the thing behind, and her spout, the thing in front, her spout, how wonderful it was. She was made of a beautiful blue porcelain. And, well, she had a lid, but she didn't want to talk about the lid because the lid had a few dents and a couple of cracks in it and, well, some defects. And, you know, we don't like talking about our defects. We leave that for others to do. But the teapot was so proud. It had something in the front and something behind. Now, the other, the other little cups and saucers and the sugar bowl, well, the teapot would explain. You know, everyone has their own defects, but they also have their virtues. The sugar bowl, for example, has two little handles and it serves the little delicacies that go with the tea. And then we have the creamer, also a serving maid to the teapot in service of the tea. And the cups and saucers, they also have handles, but none of them have a spout. And that's why I am the queen of the tea table. She was a teapot. She was a me pot. Short and stout with a handle and a spout. She didn't care about anyone or anything. She was the bosser over the cups and saucers. Just tip her over and pour her out. That is the way the teapot talked when it was very young. But one day, the delicate hands that handled the teapot, well, they were awkward. And on that one fateful day, dropped the teapot. It went spiraling down to the ground, onto the floor, rolling, rolling, the handle breaking off, the beautiful, stout, sturdy spout also breaking off, rolling under the table, and then the lid was a goner, smashed up, tea flowing out of its body onto the rug. The hands were apologetic. She cleaned up the mess and brought out another teapot so that they can continue the tea. Meanwhile, they took the broken teapot and put it on a shelf. If that wasn't bad enough, said the teapot, I became an invalid in seconds. There I was. No one paid any attention to me. I was broken inside and out. But the worst part, the worst part was that they all laughed at me. <laughs> Look at her. <laughs> oh, she's the boss. <laughs> You ain't the boss of now. Look at you. Oh, cracked up. She's a crackpot. That's what she is. Is she a crackpot? Yeah. <laughs> she's a crackpot. <laughs> Poor teapot. She sat there for a very long time. Nobody paid any attention to her. Until one fateful day, there was a knock at the back door. A little old woman was there. And she was very poor and she was just looking for anything that anyone could offer her, anybody that was extra. Do you have anything extra that I could maybe have and take to my house? I, I really don't have much. And you know, with the, the day, way these things are these days, we can always recycle things. So maybe you have something you can give me. The hands said, I know just the thing. 
and went and took the teapot and gave it to the woman. The woman took the teapot home to her little house and the teapot said, I felt broken, but that one day my better life began. I fell into poverty and went to live with this woman. She took, put me on the windowsill and started to put earth inside. I felt like I was drowning, like I was being buried alive. But then she also put in a flower bulb. I felt that bulb go deep down inside of me. And the bulb, the bulb, I could feel it growing, living. After a while, the bulb developed sprouts and then had thoughts and put out feelings. And I felt that the bulb became my living heart. Instead of the water and the leaves and the handle and the spout, I now had a heart. And then that bulb grew a stem and leaves and a flower appeared, a beautiful flower. And I was part of it. It was a part of me. I never had those kinds of feelings before. It was quite wonderful to forget oneself in something else. Yes, I had been a teapot, but now I had a heart. I was part of that beautiful flower. And then one day, someone came in and looked at the flower in the window and said, you know what? That flower is beautiful, but it deserves a better pot and it's getting bigger. You really should put it in a bigger pot. And that's when they cracked me open with a hammer and I broke into pieces and they took out the flower and put it in a new pot. And they took the pieces and threw them out into the backyard. The teapot had many, many experiences. It lived a long time. And while it was living out there underneath the dirt, it had many, many thoughts. Once I was a teapot with a handle and a spout and I made tea and then I had a heart. I bore it, I thought it, I felt it and I had a great love for that flower. When someone comes and finds my pieces, they may not know what I was used for, but I'll remember, I'll know. The feeling of that flower and my heart opening up and giving to it. She was a teapot, but then she became a wee pot. Short and stout, no handle, no spout. She learned to care about something, someone. She was not alone. Now she felt love inside and out and beauty inside and out. If you tip her over, her heart pours out. April. That was just absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Good medicine for this day. Thank you for really bringing Anderson's story alive with such, such grace. But thank you. I have people in Ireland and in India who are loving this and Brooklyn. <laughs> so I cannot thank you enough and 
Simon, come on back on, and we'll see you later. Please stay with us. So, yeah, we got some amazing comments um, from that story. I I was bowled over by it, I have to say. We got people in New Mexico, Bob Kangas and his wife. And, uh, yeah, Anna Mata. That, that just summed it up. It was such a beautiful story. We got people... All sorts of people loving this. <laughs> so, just sharing some of the comments. So, uh, yeah, that was that was amazing, absolutely amazing. They're all coming in now, of course. <laughs> Lots of storytellers. Anna Meta, who is really uh, the president of um, the Hans Christian Andersen Storytelling Center, who grew up listening to these stories in Denmark. Yes. Which so is, you know, for someone that grew up Simon? with those stories, as much as I grew up with Grimm, for someone like Anna Meta to say what she said is like, you know, that's <laughs> nailing it on the head there. So good job, April. Love it. All right. So you ready for your next storyteller? <laughs> Our next storyteller is Regina Ress. And she's been telling stories for over 30 years. And this is her 28th day at the statue. She teaches storytelling at NYU and has worked with narrative to advocate and heal women suffering from abuse, which is an amazing thing to do. It's a very powerful thing to do. So yay, Regina, for doing that. And she, she has a split personality because she lives in both New York and New Mexico. No, she doesn't. That's a lie. <laughs> She's a, she's a very wonderful person. And right now, she is going to tell a story. Are you ready? I, I am. I you am. sure? Can I just say, April, I loved that. <laughs> so, um, whoever did something or other would uh, win the hand of the princess and half the kingdom. You know, the opening to many stories is that one. He who would do X, Y, Z would win the princess and in the bargain uh, get half the kingdom. Anderson wrote a wonderful story that begins like that, but it's a very different story. Um, and it's a uh, not very well-known story. Um, Diane Wolkstein showed it to me many, many years ago, and she said, check this out. And I've been telling it ever since. So the one who could do the most incredible thing would win the hand of the princess and half the kingdom. And many men tried, oh, young men and old men, and and they they did whatever they could. Uh, two men ate themselves to death, or one man drank himself to death. Well, that wasn't really it. Um, boys in the street, they tried spitting on their own backs. <laughs> but that, that wasn't really it either. Well, there was to be a day of decision, and judges were appointed judges from the ages of three to 60 were appointed and there was a, a great hall and people brought their most incredible things and and places to demonstrate their most incredible things and and the day of decision the whole town had a holiday and everyone was there and everyone agreed there was one thing in that hall that that was obviously the most incredible thing. Uh, it was a clock. Oh, it was a, a, a clock marvelous to look at, beautiful to look at, big clock. And it was so beautiful to look at, but the most amazing part of it was that from it on the hour came living figures and they would come out and they would speak and have conversations and there would be music and movement. And each hour had a different figure and it was fantastic. I'm going to tell you what they were, all right? When the clock struck one, Moses came out. Moses came out and he held the tablets of the law in his hand. And of course, he only had one law written on the commandments. One, one God, first commandment. When the clock struck two, it was the Garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve came out. Oh, they were so happy. They didn't even have so much as a dresser drawer. But then they didn't need one, did they? The clock struck three. And it was the three wise men. And they were bringing gifts to the child in the manger. When the clock struck four, it was the four seasons. Spring, 
Oh, spring was a cuckoo on a beech bough. And summer, summer was a grasshopper on a ripe ear of corn. And autumn, oh, was a stork's nest. The stork had flown. Well, it was time to fly because next came winter. And winter was an old crow sitting at the corner of the chimney telling stories. The clock struck five, and it was the five senses. Well, sight was an optician making eyeglasses. Hearing was a coppersmith hammering with his little hammer. Smell was a young lady selling violets and woodruff. Oh, would you buy my flowers? Taste was a cook. Mm. And feeling, feeling was an undertaker, an undertaker draped in crepe head to toe. The clock struck six. It was a gambler. He had dice, and every time he rolled the dice, came up six. Seven, seven was the seven days of the week, or perhaps it was uh, the seven deadly sins. You know, sometimes it's hard to tell them apart. Eight was a choir singing eight o'clock prayers. Nine was the nine muses. Nine was the nine muses. The first one was an astronomer. The second one, a keeper of historical archives. And the rest of them has something or other to do with the theater. A ten was Moses again, of course, and, and now he had all ten of the commandments. All ten were written. Eleven, oh, it was a group of children. They were playing and singing and hopping. Two and two and seven, the clock has struck eleven. And twelve, wow, twelve was the night watchman. He came out in his fur cap. And he carried his halberd with him. And when he sang, he sang the song of the old watchman. Twas at the hour of midnight, our Savior, he was born. <gasps> and when he sang his song, flowers appeared, and they grew, and they bloomed, and they turned into angel heads, and the angel heads flew off on wings of rainbows. Oh! Oh, this clock was a matchless work of art, beautiful to look at, wonderful to hear. And everyone agreed, well, this was obviously the most incredible thing. I mean, and people were nodding and smiling and nodding and smiling at the judges and nodding and smiling at the young man. Oh, the young man who made the clock. He was a lovely young man. He was a good-looking guy, yes, kind to his parents, very nice to his family, oh, yes, and he took care of his community. He was a very fine young man. He definitely deserved the princess and half the kingdom. And he made the most incredible thing. No, no, I shall do that. And all of a sudden from the crowd came this tall, bony guy, this man, this fellow, and he walked up to the clock and he said, I am the one to do the most incredible thing. And in his hand, he had an axe and he took that axe and smashed the clock and it flew apart into smithereens and gizmos and wheels went spinning all over the, the room and, and everyone looked around and said, oh my Goodness, that's the most incredible thing. How could anybody destroy a, a work of art like that? How? That is the most incredible thing. And he said, yes, that was for me to do the most incredible thing. And my work has overcome his and overcome all of you, too. I win. And everyone looked around. Well, that, that was just incredible. How could you, how could they, how... It was the most incredible thing, and uh oh, uh, well, <laughs> a promise is a promise. He had done the most incredible thing, and so the princess was to be his and have the kingdom. 
and the wedding was announced. The trumpeters from the ramparts, they, they, they announced the wedding, the princess, she wasn't too happy, but the day arrived, it was an evening and to be in the church, and the church was lit with candles. Oh, churches always look good in candlelight, don't they? And she looked beautiful. She wasn't too happy, but she was charming and her dress was gorgeous. Now, all of the noble young women, they walked the princess forward and they sang as they walked her forward. And the noble young men walked that lanky fellow forward, and they sang as well. And that uh, fellow, well, he strutted. Nothing could destroy him, he thought. And so the singing stopped, and it was silent, and you could hear a pin drop. And then suddenly, from that silence, bam, bam, and the doors of the church opened. And in, into the church came the whole works, that clockwork, marching down the passageway toward the bride and the groom. It marched down there and planted itself right between the bride and the groom. Now, dead men cannot walk again, this we know. But a work of art, a work of art can walk again. The body was destroyed, but not the spirit. The body had been smashed, but not the spirit. And that whole clockwork stood there, gathered itself together, and began to chime the hours from one to twelve. Moses came out. Moses came out, and this time he had flames coming out of his forehead. And he took the tablets of the law, and he threw it down on the feet of that bridegroom. And he said, there, stay there. I cannot pick this up. You've knocked my arms off. And then Adam and Eve came out, and the three wise men, and the four seasons. And they all said very unpleasant things about the young man. They told him unpleasant things about himself. Shame, they said. But he was not ashamed. No. And then all of the other figures of the clock came swarming out and they grew into a terrible size. They grew so big. It was as though the people in the church had no space to be there. And they all told him things about himself. And then, and then, the night watchman came out and he strode up to that fellow and with his halberd he smashed that man right in the forehead and he said there take that we are avenged and our young master too and we disappear and the whole work disappeared it disappeared but when it disappeared all of those candles all over the church. The candles turned into bouquets of beautiful flowers and the gilded stars and the ceiling of the church sent out long and luminous beams and they lit the church and the organ played all by itself. And the people, the people were astonished and said, that's the most incredible experience we've ever had. And just then, a voice, a voice seldom heard, but now, summon the right one. It was the princess. Summon the right one. He who made the clock should be my husband. Oh, of course, everybody agreed. Of course, of course, and the whole town stood up for him. And the two of them were married. And the town, everyone blessed them and wished them joy. And not one of them was jealous. And that was the most incredible thing of all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Regina. Story for our time. 
Really, you know what's interesting? This story was written in 1870, but uh, during the Nazi occupation of Denmark in 1942, this was the story of Andersen's that was published again, sort of an in-disguise statement of what really mattered in the world. Maybe once again it is as completely relevant. So thank you so much for that story. I uh, What I read at some point was that one and the Wicked Prince um, were banned by the Nazis but circulated in the underground. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much and we'll all be back here together again for chatting after stories and so we have a little bit of um, comments. We've had beautiful comments. It's wonderful. There are people from Mexico, from um, Ireland, from India, all over the United States listening to us today. So thank you so much, Regina. And our third story tells the first time. I can't believe that you haven't been here at the statue before, Randall McGee. And Randall is living in California. But he's a puppeteer, a storyteller, a writer, and a kind of um, lover of Anderson's stories in, in a really unique and brilliant way. So Randall actually becomes Hans Christian Anderson, tells the stories as if he is Hans Christian Anderson. And that's what Anderson did, actually. He told these stories, sometimes over and over again as he was writing them. And the more people who loved them, those are the details that he kept. But he's going to tell us a, a story, won many, many awards and travels throughout the world doing this. So we're really thrilled that he has come to join us today. And also Randall does paper cuts just as Anderson did. So. When I turn this over to Randall McGee, you'll be hearing the voice of Hans Christian Andersen. Thank you, Randall. Hello. Good day. For the unheard of, eh? Yeah, Hans Christian Andersen. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I forget that you don't all speak Danish. <laughs> Let me start again. Uh, hello. I am Hans Christian Andersen. But then you knew that. That is why you are here, yeah? Please, call me Ossi. Uh, that is my name in Danish. Uh, it is for H-C, my initials, Ossi. So please, uh, make yourselves comfortable. Yes, uh, let me tell you a little bit about my life. I was born in Odense in Denmark. My father was a tailor. And my mother, well, she was a washerwoman. She would wash the clothes of other people, you see. And I would go with her down to the river to wash clothes with the other women. And as they washed clothes, I would sing for them. Yeah, you see, I had a very beautiful voice when I was a child. I don't know where it went, but I would sing for them. And one day, one of the other women said, Do you know that if you were to go straight down through this earth, you would come out in China? And perhaps the emperor of China would hear your singing and want you to come to his castle. <laughs> well, she said that just for fun. But in my imagination as a child, oh, I could just imagine the greatest fantasies coming true. The next day, I even told some of the children in the neighborhood, the emperor of China has heard about my beautiful singing. He is sending messengers to come and find me and take me back to his castle where I will live in a porcelain room and eat off of silver plates and wear silk slippers. Well, the other children thought I was crazy. Oh, I would tell stories to my parents and whoever would listen about how the animals and the plants would tell me their secrets. My mother was worried. She took me to a wise woman in town. You might call her a fortune teller. And the wise woman looked at my mother's tea leaves. Oh, mm -hmm. and then she felt the bumps on my head. Oh, she said, I foresee that your son will become a fine gentleman, famous throughout the land. 
In fact, all of Orinsa will be illuminated in his honor. Oh, my mother was very pleased. Two Reichs dollars, please. <laughs> well, I knew that I could not become famous in little Odense. So at the age of 14, I kissed my mother goodbye, and I headed off to the capital city of Copenhagen, or, or Copenhagen, you may say. And I went straight to the theater because I wanted to be an actor. And I pounded on the door. Boom, boom, boom. The stage manager opened the door. <coughs> yes. Oh, please, sir, I want to work in the theater, I said. I can act, I can dance, I can sing. I will hold a spear, I will push a broom. Please give me a job in the theater. Well, he looked at me up and down and said, you are far too skinny. If you give me a job, I'll fatten up soon enough, I said. Boom. Needless to say, I did not get that job. I suffered for quite a while. I, I struggled, but as luck would have it, I was able to sing for a group of fine gentlemen and ladies. And one of those fine gentlemen, he took pity on me. He was concerned for me. And though he was not the emperor of China, he did take me into his home. He treated me very well and he sent me off to a formal school. Yeah. But there at the school, my imagination got me into trouble. For instead of studying my Latin, quid me anxious sum, I was writing stories, stories about everything around me. For you see, to me, every person and everything has a character and a story to tell. A, a teapot, an oak tree, a, a pair of scissors, or even a gentleman's collar might have its own particular story to tell. And so I will tell you the story of the collar. And as I do, I will take my scissors and my paper here and I will make a papier clip or a little paper cut design, as you may call it. For you see, there was a gentleman of some renown, a famous writer who traveled all around the world. And so he did not take very much with him, but he had a very fine collar that he wore whenever he went to the best of places, the theater or to dinner parties. He also had a comb, of course, and a boot jack. You know what you used to put on your boots. And the comb and the boot jack and, and the collar were sitting there on the dresser one day and the collar took it into his mind that he wanted to be married. I don't know why. Well, just then the collar was picked up and thrown into a nice warm tub of soapy water where he soon relaxed and became very relaxed and, and comfortable and he looked over and next to him he saw the most beautiful piece of, of clothing he had ever seen. Soft, a light blue with a little bit of lace around the top. It was a garter, you know, what ladies wear under uh, their dresses to hold up their stockings above the knee and very few people would see such a thing because it would be improper to see a lady's leg above the ankle, you know. Well, the caller fell instantly in love. Hello, my dear, he said. You are very soft, so beautiful. Um, may I have your name, please? I shall not tell you, said the garter. Oh, but please, won't you at least tell me where it is that you are worn on the body? Oh, it is neither proper for you to ask or decent for me to say. Please don't talk to me. I have not given you permission to do so. Oh, said the caller, but your beauty is permission enough. Uh, wouldn't you please like to be married, my dear, and join me in, in traveling around the world? I don't want to talk to you. There's something masculine about you. 
Oh, that is very true, said the caller, for you see, I am a fine gentleman. I have a human to serve me and take me all around the world. I even own a comb and my own boot jack. Well, this was a lie, as you probably already know. But then, who has not lied just a little bit to impress a lady? Huh? Well, uh, the, the garter then said to him, I don't want to talk to you. Please go away. What a prude, said the caller. And at that, he was plucked out of the wash table and he was dumped into a bowl of starch. <laughs> well, then he was laid on the back of a chair to dry in the sun. And then he was placed on a board and a hot iron was run over top of him shh, shh, to press him straight. Oh, said the caller, oh, my dear lady, oh, your embrace just makes me warm all over. I can feel as if I'm young again. All of my wrinkles are disappearing. Oh, you must be a widow, for you know how to make a man feel warm inside. Oh, will you not please marry me, my dear? Hush, hush, said the steam iron, for she was thinking of herself as if she were a steam train running down the track to places far away. Hush. Well, the collar was picked up. And it was seen that there were a few little strands of thread hanging off. And so scissors were brought forth. And when the caller saw those scissors snipping his threads, he said, Oh, my, what long, straight, beautiful legs you have. You must be a dancer, a ballerina, I would say. Have you thought of marriage? Quiet, snipped the scissors. I'm not here to talk to you. I'm here to work. Oh, but my dear, you deserve the best in life. You deserve to travel the world. I am a fine gentleman. I have a servant who takes me all around the world. I own a comb and a boot jack. There's that lie again, you see. Won't you please join me as I travel around the world? Quiet, rag! She snapped and cut him on the back. Oh, dear, he said. You have cut me. I hope I am not scarred for life. Well, I hope I am still useful to my, to my human. And he was. And so the collar was used for another several months until he became very worn out. It didn't look good at all to be wear, worn in public. And the human threw him in a rag bag and sent it off to the paper mill to be made into paper. Well, there at the paper mill, the collar was tossed between two piles of linens. The one pile was the men's pile, the shirts, and the other pile was the ladies' pile of very delicate things that most people don't talk about. It was ladies' underwear. And the two piles were talking among themselves, and so the caller, to get attention, said, Oh, woe is me, unless I deserve to be made into paper for all of the wrongs I have done. Well, this, of course, attracted everyone's attention, and they all stopped to listen. Yes, he said, Oh, I have been such a rogue and a cad, said the caller. I have had many loves and sweethearts, and I have broken all of their hearts and left them to shame. Oh, said all of the shirts, and ah, said all of the ladies, underwear. Well, he said, uh, my first love was a lady's garter, I believe. She was soft, she was delicate, but we revolved in two different circles. It was not to be, and when I told her so, she was so lovesick, she drowned her sorrows in a tub of water. Oh, said all of the shirts. Ah, said all of the ladies underwear, for they were familiar with the garters. But then he said, 
Oh, I had a steamy romance with a hot iron, a widow who knew how to make a man feel warm. All of the men's shirts said, ho, ho, ho. They also had had a time with the iron, you see. And all of the lady underwear, they couldn't understand, for they had never really seen an iron, for who among us starches and irons their underwear? The caller then said, oh, and then I had a, a, a fling with a pair of scissors, a ballet dancer. She was so angry when I said it was over that she cut me, and you can still see the mark on my back. Oh, and then I was thrown into this bag, and I have become here to become a piece of paper, and it is just as well. And so you see, the collar was turned into a piece of paper. He was shredded, drowned, beaten to a pulp, stretched out to dry, and then the collar was folded and cut so that all the world could see his story. And here you see the caller as he is surrounded by the men's shirts and the ladies, you said it, and the scissors. You see the little nick on his back. And he was made so that now everyone knows the story of the caller with all its dirty laundry. There is a moral to this story, I'm sure, but I will let you figure that one out. Thank you very much. Mangatak. <laughs> that was brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. So beautiful. I mean, I'm now going to really have more compassion when I use my iron. <laughs> <laughs> That was F. Thank you so much. Can you show that paper cut again? Certainly. Usually, I I uh, will uh, give these to the sponsors. So, Laura, I'll be sending this to you. Oh, thank you so much. And Simon, I've I've got a practice one that I'll send to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, while you were um, paper cutting and telling the story, uh, Simon revealed that his mother used to iron underwear just so that you know <laughs> <laughs> who you're dealing with here <laughs> and we have lasa jorgensen it's from true Odense she listening. did oh i was in <laughs> Odense last october i loved it it was a beautiful town well we'll all have to gather there because there's a new museum completely dedicated to anderson and i think it's summer after next that it will be finished it's yes great and um so lots of stories are told there and here's our great storytellers back again what a wonderful hour it went too fast april needs to <laughs> unmute herself she took control <laughs> <laughs> now okay you. now i'm back thank you yeah, such wonderful stories that was really great and as you see you how much all three of you have been appreciated in your, the stories and the storytelling and so refreshing. Tracy Collins from near Liverpool, who runs this amazing uh, storytelling series, is listening. Bob Canagas from New Mexico, fantastic storyteller. So yeah, we've got a lot of people here. And you know, um, I'm going to put back the. Uh, you know, you can always watch this again on oh, yeah. YouTube. And yeah. um, so, Simon, mm -hmm. what's going on? What do you want well, to say about these stories and these fantastic storytellers we have had here? Oh, I hate saying it, but I'm falling more and more in love with Hans Christian Andersen's <laughs> work each week. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I've said yeah. this before. I was never a big fan of Anderson, but um, I like some of his stuff, but not all of it. But now I'm like hearing it, but told, it's like I'm really getting into it. And, and the stories that I heard today, I think I might have to tell the underwear story because that was just. <laughs> but I guess it's you know how how they're told. I mean, yeah. each of these three tellers really was able to pace it and 
give it the dignity and feeling and rhythm and life that these stories really come alive through. So it was a pleasure. It was. It was. And yeah. so next week, no, actually, first of all, I want to say another massive thank you to April and to Regina and Randall. Randall did stand in at the last minute for Rachel H Harrington and um, I'm, I'm really glad, I mean, I'm sorry that she wasn't able to come here today, but I'm really glad that Randall was because um, I think there's a lot of people on the East Coast like myself who'd never heard of you before and to see you do your craft was just like really, really fun. And also again, I've never seen Regina and I've only seen April maybe once. And so it was a real treat to see them perform again as well. Next week, we have Jim Brawl, who hails from New York. And then we have Angela Holverson Bogo. I hope I pronounced that properly. Yes. And Donna Jacobs Seif. Um, so Donna lives in Australia. Oh, cool. And she is a, a gorgeous storyteller who's done some of the most magnificent piece work uh, throughout Australia and many places in the world. And, and Angela was born in. Um, Ireland, but she's been living in Norway for many, many, many years, and she is a beautiful storyteller and singer. And Jim Brule is really, um, he, he specializes in Jewish stories. He's considered a Magid, or a sort of holy storyteller. So I think, again, we're going to have an absolutely beautiful time. But April has CDs. And uh, Regina has CDs, and so does Randall, and they have websites with their names. So please um, go there and purchase. And we're going to put up in next by next week our really our uh, tip bucket and fundraising capacities because we want to keep doing this. This is the 63rd year of Anderson Stories. It is the first summer that we've had all Anderson stories and um, you won't believe it but for some of these storytellers this is the first time they're telling this story and they brought it to life for us and I just cannot thank you all enough absolutely oh your son is watching Matt, um, Randall <laughs> that's quite a clue when your son says nicely done dad <laughs> <laughs> A mutual admiration society. Absolutely. And um, a good friend of mine in Colorado, Mindy Goldman Upton, who's an educator and uh, actually makes the most incredible puppets, is just raving also. So thank you all. A special thank you to Simon. Um, this is no easy task, keeping up with this. So Simon, thank you. and. Um, we're going to have other opportunities for Simon to tell stories, uh, myself coming back, and please join us next week. Tell people about this. And uh, love to you all. Stay safe and happy and uh, uplifted. And drink tea and never forget to pour out your heart. And uh, as Maria Tatar said about Regina's story, the most incredible thing that this is a story um, needed in the world about the essence of art. And the story of the collar, so compassionate and beautiful and humorous. So thank you all and see you next week.